Hello, everyone, and welcome to day one of Arab Oil and Gas Academy Internship Program. This is Nihal Munir. I'll be your moderator for the day. Uh, for the sake of the time, and um, we will be just setting some few ground rules. Number one, all your questions should go into the Q&A part and YouTube live, not the chat part because I, I won't be looking at that. Uh, number two, today's session is a bit on the longer side, so we might not be able to answer or take all your questions. Uh, still write them though, and we will collect them and ask the instructor to shoot uh, a short video for you to answer all the, um, to, to answer all your FQAs, frequently asked questions. Okay, so without any further ado, let me start with introducing our speaker for the day. Our speaker for today is Dr. Mustafa Urabi. Dr. Mustafa Urabi has over uh, 26 years of experience in petroleum industry. He holds a PhD degree from North Carolina State University in the USA and a master's and bachelor's degree from um, Faculty of Engineering at Alexandria University. Dr. Urabi has joined Alexandria University in early career as an assistant lecturer until he obtained his master's degree he also used to teach at community college in the USA. In the industry, Dr. Rabi held um, so many positions in all aspects of petroleum industry and lived in many countries around the globe. Uh, let me just tell you something. Dr. Rabi is one of the oil giants in Egypt and in the world. So take advantage of this session very, very well. And good luck, Dr. Rabi. Um, Mike is with you. Thank you, Engineer Nihal. Uh, without taking any more time, I think let's uh, start the, uh, the presentation. Uh, the presentation actually, it's an introduction to the petroleum industry. We'll let you in a glance, what is the petroleum industry? Uh, we'll start with uh, engineering. What type of engineers do we hire? What kind of companies do we deal with? Before we get into depth of what is the oil and, in oil and gas industry or the petroleum industry is working. Okay, so let me start with It is the employment diversity. Actually, the oil and gas industry is very well known to be a diverse industry. Diverse means it actually uh, hire and deal with different engineering backgrounds. We are not really hiring only petroleum engineers. All aspects of engineering is required in the oil and gas industry. So the petroleum industry hires a broad spectrum of engineers. That actually goes starting from the geologists petroleum engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, all aspects of engineering. And you will see this through the presentation and through also the discussion when we have the discussion. It, all, the, all these sides of engineering are required and hired in the petroleum industry, okay? So this means we have a variety of engineers and have a variety of backgrounds. So the lecture will set the, uh, the, set the, to the background on the basics uh, of the industry for all these diverse engineering. Now, what are the type of petroleum companies you, are, you will be dealing with when you graduate? Actually, we can divide the petroleum companies into three different categories. Okay? The first category, we call it the operating companies. Right? So the first category of the oil and gas or the petroleum industry are the operating companies. The second category is the service companies. And the third category will be the consulting companies. So you have actually three different type of companies that you can, you can be hired from and work with in the oil and gas industry. The first one is actually, you call them the owner, owner of the fields. So the companies that own the field and the one that's responsible for producing the hydrocarbon, selling the hydrocarbon, making profits out of the hydrocarbon is what we call the operating companies. Example of these companies, the Shell, BP, ExxonMobil, all these big giant companies, and also at the same time, small companies as well. They, they deal with the small. The second one is a service company where they deliver all services required for producing the hydrocarbons. Example of these service companies is Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker Atlas, uh, all these service companies that provide services that help the operating company to produce. Okay, starts from the rigs is a service company, 
the drilling companies are service company, logging companies are service companies, and so on. So these are the service companies. They are not, they don't own the fields, they don't uh, operate the fields, but they only provide services to the oil companies. Then it comes to the consulting companies. Consulting companies actually, they require a bit of some experience before you join these companies because they consult for these big companies and small companies. The high percent is for small companies who they don't have the manpower or they have the technology to really run and operate and manage the fields. So the consulting company's role is probably training, making some field studies and so on. So the support for the oil and gas industry and also support for the service industry for some time. Okay. So these are the different types of uh, uh, companies that you will deal with after you graduate. And you need to look at all these companies. Probably you go to the internet and find out more information about what are these companies that they are operating? What are the companies that are service company? Make sure that you'll get ready, that you will be able to join one of these companies. Again, the consulting companies require some uh, experiences, so you may not be able to join consulting company when you are a young engineer. Okay, so with this, actually, let's just go and look at the from planning to production review. How do we plan? How do we produce? What are we doing for the planning and the production? Okay. In this presentation, I will also use some videos. Uh, make sure that you follow the videos. I will actually put the videos on and then do some comments on them after. Make sure that you get a glimpse of what, what is the real, real thing in the oil and gas industry. If you look at the petroleum industry, it's actually a, a, an overview, it'll give you an overview of what is this industry. The industry is actually, you can call it a circle. It's a circle of very well-connected operations. This operation, the whole goal of all these inputs is to produce the hydrocarbon from the downhole. Okay. I can actually divide this into, into segments, but before we divide them, we have to make sure that the basics, the logo, the background of all what we do based on integration and teamwork. So integration and teamwork are the basics in our industry. We all are integrated. We cannot actually do this, any, anything, any of this in isolation. Every job is based on the previous job and you will see the connectivity between all these services, all these operations that we deal with requires integration and teamwork. So please learn how to be a, a team player. This is very, very important. How to build, how to build your communication skills, how to that's, that's go side by side with your engineering skills. If you have the best engineering skills, but you don't know how to integrate with others, how to communicate with others, that's really a big hurdle in the petroleum industry. The whole thing is planned, whole thing is depending on each other. And that's why the integration and the teamwork is very, very crucial in our industry. Okay, as I said, we can divide this into three major segments. Okay, the first segment is identification of the hydrocarbon location, drilling after the identification and evaluation after the drilling. These three, they can be combined together very heavily dependent on each other. So the identification of the possibility of finding hydrocarbon, then drilling, after you identify the possibility, you start drilling. After you drill, you need to evaluate the zones of interest that you will produce from, okay? The second part of it is once you identify, drilled and evaluated, then you need to complete your drilling and to produce your hydrocarbon. So the, from the identification, drilling, evaluation down to completion and production, very well linked with each other, very well planned ahead, very well dependent on integration and teamwork. Once you're done with the well and the well is on production, you drill many, many wells in the field, then you need to have a field management, how to manage this field, okay? As I said, components for all of these circles are very well connected together, I'm repeating myself and integration and teamwork, keep this in your mind, work with yourself and your skills on how to integrate with others and how to be a team player, okay? 
Okay, what are these aspects? First of all, geology and geophysics. That's the when we start. Geologists and geophysicists are the first to start of giving the opportunity, identifying the opportunity. We'll go through this in some, some details later on. And some of these aspects I'm not going to go and cover in details because I'm very sure there'll be other uh, in-depth uh, webinars that will talk about this in detail. But I will give you a glimpse. What are these? What is, what is geology? What geophysics? What are the roles of the geologists and the geophysicists in the oil and gas industry? So you start with geology and geophysics. Once you started and identified the potential of hydrocarbon location, then you start doing drilling. Drilling is actually depends on so many parts. The first part of the drilling is the bits. We'll talk about the bits. What is the bit? What is the role of the bit in the drilling? What type of bits are we dealing with? Again, it will be just an overview and, and you will be very much uh, getting into depth in some other webinars. So the drilling starts with the bits. Then we go for what we call the bottom hole assembly. What is the bottom hole assembly? What is the composition of the bottom hole assembly? It, this is the assembly that we drill, that we drill with and uh, reach the target where we identified as a potential of hydrocarbon location. Okay, once you do this, then you go for drilling. You cannot do it without what we call drilling fluids. Drilling fluids requires some type of engineering, okay, and some type of, of uh, design because it's a very, very important part of our drilling. Call it the drilling fluid, which is known in our industry as mud, okay? Now, you, you identify the location, you started drilling using bits, bottom hole assembly, and mud. Once you drill this, then you have to go and evaluate. Evaluate, we call it logging. We do the logging in two different times. One of the logging that can, we can do while we are drilling, we call it LWD, logging while drilling. And we can also do it after drilling, which we call it wireline logging. So we have the wireline logging, you do it after drilling. LWD is evaluation while you drill. LWD is very, very critical in certain type of wells. We'll talk about this when we talk about the wells. Once you do this, also you need to test to see if there is any possibility of doing some testing and uh, how much of production we will be able to get, what is the reservoir limits, many things that you, you get information from, from the testing. Now we drill the well, and the well now is we call it open hole well. It means we drilled, bottom hole assembly is there, mud is there, then you, then you lift or you, or you take the bottom hole assembly out of the well. You cannot leave the well open as is filled with the drilling fluid. Then the next step is to do what we call cementing. Cementing is, you, don't actually, you actually put a casing, casing are pipes with certain dimension, with certain properties. Um, again, you will study this in detail in some other uh, webinars, but we'll talk about this and what is the role of these pipes. The role of this pipe is to make sure that the hole is in, is in contact. There is not going to be any collapse. So this actually prevents the collapsing from the hole. Then we start cementing these pipes or these casings into the well bore with the cementing operation. Cementing operation is the operation that actually makes sure that all the casing is very well attached to the well bore and there is no gaps, there is no zones that has no cementing in there. Make sure that we put the well in a proper condition, ready to be produced. Now we drill the well, we actually put the casing, we cemented the casing. Now our reservoir is completely blocked. It cannot produce on its own. Then we do some, what we call perforation. Perforation is making holes in the casing to allow passage, to allow a path for the hydrocarbon to come from the formation or from our reservoir down to the well bore and up to the surface. Okay, so the perforation is creating path, putting holes inside the casing all the way down, all the way down to, the, to the formation itself, to the reservoir itself. Okay, I'm saying formation and reservoir 
We'll talk about this, these definitions also through this, this webinar. What is a formation? What is a reservoir? What is the composition of this? And we'll also see all this operation live and what does it mean? What do we mean by perforation? And what is the role of perforation in, uh, in the uh, uh, operation? Once you did the perforation and you allowed your reservoir to get in, well, we do something called production enhancement. What is the production enhancement? In many cases, our reservoir, because it's a, what we call it tight reservoir. Tight reservoir means it does not have enough permeability. Permeability is permission of hydrocarbon or fluids to flow. If the, the permeability of our rock is very tight, then the, the fluid will not be able to come out of the formation into the well bore. We do this, but what we call production enhancement. We enhance the production. We increase the possibility of producing our hydrocarbon. We are not enhancing the hydrocarbon itself. We're just, we're just giving more path for our hydrocarbon to flow from the, from the reservoir into our well bore for production. We'll talk about this also in some more details. Okay. Also, there is something called completion tools. Completion tools is certain type of tools and technology that we use to control our production and also to enhance our production. So there are some uh, type of technology like plugs, like uh, certain type of uh, uh, flow. Is it a single flow? It's a double flow. What type of flow that we require? Again, I will touch on this, but I will not go into depth because you would be, this would be covered in some other uh, seminars, uh, webinars, okay? Artificial lift, sometimes when you produce the well, you don't have enough pressure or enough power in the well bore to lift the hydrocarbon all the way to the surface. Once you, you, you lose this power of lifting your hydrocarbon to the surface, we need to get in and try to help the fluids to go up into the surface, what we call it artificial lift. So artificial lift is something that we use, helping the hydrocarbon that actually cannot flow. It's on its own because it doesn't have enough energy to flow. We need this to help the hydrocarbon to reach the surface and get produced. Okay, now to go to the last sta state, which is the field. Man. Now your well is drilled, you completed the well, you help the well if it, if it needs help for production or artificial lift. Now your well is on production. When the well is on production, now we go to the field management. You have to manage this type of production. Okay, managing the, the field is a very, very big thing. It's a 24 hours, seven days a week, continuously monitoring what are these wells doing, what is the potential of each one, what are the problems in each well. Then you, do, you have to be very, very careful when you handle your reservoir, because that's the part of what everybody is looking for, producing the hydrocarbon to the optimum way of production. And that's what we call the field management. So this is just a way of looking at what are the different type of services? What are the different type of steps? All these steps are very well connected together. You cannot do one operation in isolation. Every one of these steps is dependent on the previous one. And even the one that comes after you, they have to, you have to know what did you do in the previous step, okay? So integration and teamwork is very crucial. Planning is very crucial in the oil and gas industry, okay? So with this introduction, we need to go and look at one by one, okay? I'm not gonna cover all of them. I will cover the most important part. So let me start with the first one, which is geology and geophysics. What is geology and what is geophysics role in the petroleum industry? Okay. Before we start talking about this, let's just give you a very small introduction on the planet Earth, because it's very, very important. We produce from the planet Earth. So what we need to understand, what is the planet Earth? Well, planet Earth, everybody is considered it as a sphere. Right? So it's a sphere, actually, with a diameter of almost 8,000 miles. If we, if we work with kilometers, about 12,500 kilometers, okay? So it is really a big diameter of a sphere, but we are not producing it from all these depths, okay? Or all these diameters, right? We're actually producing from the, the crust, the very, very uh, first part of, 
of the earth that we deal with. We don't go all the way deeper to 8,000 miles or anything. So we cannot, we cannot do that. We just produce from the crust. We'll talk about the crust and the deposition in a minute. Okay? So this is actually what the diameter of our earth is. Well, if you have the diameter, you can calculate the circumference. The circumference of the earth is about 25,000 miles. So we have the circumference of the earth. We know the diameter of the earth. Also, we know the age of the earth. The age of the earth is approximately 4.5 billion years. Okay. Now you can ask yourself a question. How did you come up with this number? How can you, how can you actually estimate the earth uh, uh, age? What, how, how you come with the 4.5 billion years? Well, we do this actually based on some type of elements that is actually in our elemental compositions of the earth that has a very, very long half-life. If you go back to your physics, okay? In the physics, you studied what we call radioisotopes. Radioisotopes are elements that have certain half-life. They actually disintegrate or they, they emit certain type of radiation and they change from one element to another element by this, this type of thing. The first element, we call it parent. And when the parent emits certain type of radioactivity, it generates what we call daughter. So you have the parents and the daughter. You go to these mountains and you look at these elements and you see how much of the parent exists today and how much of the, of the daughter exists today. And by applying your basic physics uh, daughter, uh, uh, parent daughter relationship of decay, then you can find out the, uh, the age of this mountain which relates to the age to the age of the earth okay these these are the some type of the radio isotope that you use mainly we use uranium and these because if you look at the uranium 230 238 for example its half-life is 4.468 10 to the power 9 years it's very 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 long half-life so now by looking at the uranium and its daughter we can actually estimate the earth age so that's how we come up with the earth age in, in the oil and gas industry. And that's actually based on, on the physics. So the physics will have also a role in the evaluation of our hydrocarbon age and potential. Because you hear, I'm very sure the, if you study the, uh, the petroleum industry, we hear about certain type of geological ages. And these geological ages are millions of years. That's how the geologists come up with these estimates based on the radioactivity of some elements, okay? So that answers the question, how do we come up with the age of the earth, right? Then how about the hydrocarbon? How the hydrocarbon is formed? We need to understand how did this hydrocarbon come? How it's generated, okay? The hydrocarbon actually is generated from the organic matters. Anything or any, uh, any rock that we look at deeper into our uh, uh, reservoirs or our fields, that was one day it was on the surface. So for example, if you drill a well for 10 to 10,000 feet, that 10,000 10, feet, million years ago, it was on the surface before it is buried underneath. So on the surface, what do you find? You find organic material. What's the organic material? Trees, leaves, stems, alga, which depends on where you are. All these materials are organic materials. These organic materials, if it's subjected to temperature and pressure, they change to hydrocarbon because they contain hydrogen and carbon in their components. That's why you call it organic matters. So the organic matters are the normal thing that we live on now. For example, if, if Earth still has millions of years to go, you will see anything that we see now on the surface will be buried down and it will be transformed into hydrocarbon as well. Do we have millions of years left for the earth? That's a good question. Nobody can answer that one, okay? So the, the hydrocarbon is formed from the organic matters buried during deposition. Deposition mainly is an accumulation of rocks over rocks over rocks, which we call it the strata. So the, the, the deposition is the accumulation of strata, of rocks, of layers over and over that bury all this organic material underneath, okay? All right. 
So the plants and their components, lifts, alga, and all of this, the, all of these materials actually compose the organic material. So the organic material in the deposition, it gets buried deeper and deeper. Then it will actually raises a very interesting question. When you bury things deeper and deeper, what happens? Okay, you see that the temperature increases if you're going deeper and the pressure increases. Take this example when you cook anything at home. Okay, it's exactly like when you cook at home. What do you do when you cook at home? You put the food in a pot, then you cover the pot and you put it on the stove. So what are you doing? First, you're increasing the temperature. Second is by covering this pot, what you do is you actually keeping the pressure. So increasing pressure, increasing temperature, that's the way we use day to day for cooking our food. That's exactly what happens, okay? Burying the strata deeper and deeper, you're increasing pressure and increasing temperature. Then these organic matters get cooked. That cooking, it will produce the food for the reservoir. What is the food? Is the organic material changes to hydrocarbon. That hydrocarbon can be oil or can be gas. What are the, the, the conditions for oil? What are the conditions of gas? That's not really the subject of today. It's just it, it, there are conditions when we can get oil, when we can get gas, we can, when we can get both. There are so many conditions of this, but for the time being, that's the way it happens. It's actually cooked and hydrocarbon is created. So we say pressure and temperature cook these organic matters and create the hydrocarbon, oil or gas. That part where the hydrocarbon is cooked and get and actually ready, we call this source rock. So when you hear the word source rock, source rock is the kitchen of our hydrocarbon. Okay. So when you hear the word source rock, it means this is the source where there was a pressure and temperature where the hydrocarbon is generated. Okay. So the source rock is the container where the hydrocarbon is originally generated due to pressure and temperature. Okay, now, once we find this hydrocarbon, and we'll talk about how we find the hydrocarbon in a, in, a, in a minute, okay, then we need to drill a well to get this hydrocarbon out, okay? So where does actually the, the hydrocarbon live after that? It's actually generated in a source rock. Then we define what's called the reservoir. What is a reservoir? A reservoir is the place where the hydrocarbon that is generated Okay, the hydrocarbon that's generated in the source rock will leave the source rock and go and live in the reservoir. So the reservoir is not the source rock. The reservoir is the place where the hydrocarbon migrates from the source rock and lives in the reservoir. Why is that? Because we have to have some properties of the reservoir to call it a reservoir. What are the properties of the reservoir that we need to look at? We will discuss this case in a second. So what is a reservoir, okay? Reservoir is actually, you go back and see how this reservoir is composed. The reservoir, very basic constituent is the grain. So we will go all the way down to the first and basic composition of any reservoir is the grain, okay? Grains, as you see, if this is one grain, all the grains will be deposited and connected together. Let's just take a very uh, idealistic uh, structure of grains getting together. So here is a grain, a second grain, a third grain, a fourth grain. They are actually now all deposited and getting together. What will happen when you do this? You will see there is grains, which is composed of a very solid uh, material. Then when they are arranged in a way, that's a very idealistic arrangement. I will show you the reality in a second. It is a very idealistic thing. But in between this thing, you will see a void here. That void doesn't have any grains. This is the way, this is the place where the hydrocarbon from the source rock will migrate and live in here. We call this one porosity. So porosity is the basic thing in our reservoir. So the basic condition in our reservoir is to see how much porosity there. What, how much of this space where our hydrocarbon, when it migrated, actually lived in there. 
So the bigger the room, the bigger this room, the better. Okay, so the higher porosity, higher pore sizes, good shape of porosity, okay, gives you a good, a good uh, reservoir. Okay, so one of the most important parameters we deal with is the porosity, the place where our fluids can live in. Right? So the hydrocarbon and water, they'll both live in there. Any fluid, hydrocarbon or water, any type of fluid can live in there. Uh, if the water lives in there, that's bad news for sure. If the, if the hydrocarbon lives in there, for sure for us as a petroleum industry, that's the good news. Right? Yeah. What is the reality? Here is the reality. Okay? It, nothing in nature goes with this very nice idealistic composition. Here is the reality. Here are the grains. Do you, how do we do this? We get a very thin layer. We call it thin section. We put the, this thin section under the microscope, and we look at it, and we take a photo of it. These are the grains, and these are the voids between the grains where the hydrocarbon can live in. If you zoom a little bit more, here, is the, here are the pores. Okay, so this is the porosity that the hydrocarbon, when it leaves the source rock, will live in. Okay? And these are the grains, as you see right there, making this porosity or the container or the place where the hydrocarbon can live in. Right? This is what we call the reservoir. So everybody understand the reservoir now. It's an accumulation of grains in a way that creates voids or places where the hydrocarbon and the other fluids can live in these, in these places. Now, we understood that the source rock is cooked, uh, is the place where our hydrocarbon is cooked. Then we defined our reservoir rock. Now, what is the mechanism that happens that makes the hydrocarbon migrate from the source rock and live in our reservoir, okay? Let's just study this a little bit. Here is a structure, very, again, very idealistic structure that the grains are distributed, accumulated, deposited in this shape, okay? Now we have to ask ourselves a question. Before the migration of hydrocarbon, what was there in these voids, in the porosity? Well. Everything originally is filled with water because it was on the surface. Don't forget this. These layers that at 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 feet or whatever, it was on the surface someday. And on the surface, there is no hydrocarbon. The fluid that will actually get in these pores will be the water. Okay, so it's originally filled with water. So water originally, we give the water the color blue. So water originally filled the spaces between the grains, okay? okay? And there are some layers, we talked about these layers, we called it the layers where the greens and the trees and the leaves and everything was there before the bury. The, the bury. When they are buried, they actually cold, they create under the high pressure, high temperature, they are, all these plants are cooked and the hydrocarbon generated. We give the hydrocarbon here, the, the color green. So the hydrocarbon is generated inside the source rock. Now, let's ask you the question. Which one of these two fluids has the highest uh, density? Is it the water or the hydrocarbon? For sure, the hydrocarbon, which is the oil, for example. If you put some oil in a, in a glass of water, the oil will come into the surface. Why? Because they are different in density. So we know that the hydrocarbon has a less dense or less dense than, than the water. Now, if the hydrocarbon has lower density, it will migrate and take the water place and pushes the water down because it is higher in density. And that's exactly what happens. So the hydrocarbon from the source rock migrates up, okay, fill the places and pushes the water, which is the blue, the water down. So you'll see that segregation right here. We'll see this is your, hydrocarbon filling or taking part of the pores and moving the water down because it's higher dense than the hydrocarbon, okay? So that's the way, that's the whole, the whole thing. That's the, how well, the hydrocarbon is created in our reservoir, right? Okay, now let's not look at the petroleum reservoirs in this case. We have two major components we talked about. The first component is hydrocarbon source. We call this the source rock. We discussed this, how the hydrocarbon is created in our source rock. 
Then we talked about the reservoir porous rock where the hydrocarbon will move from the source rock by the, the difference or the segregation of density. It will move from the source rock and go and replace the water in the pore space in our reservoir and pushes the water down, okay? All right. Now, there is another very important question you have to ask yourself. This is actually the engineering thinking, huh? You have to ask question after question after question, okay? Now, what actually the mechanism that stops the hydrocarbon from moving up and up and up and up, okay? If there is nothing to stop it, then it will keep migrating, correct? It will keep migrating up because it's lower density. So we need something to stop the hydrocarbon from, from continuous migration. This is what we call the ceiling or the seal. You have to have a seal on the top, okay? On the top of your reservoir rock, you require a seal. There are so many types of seals. Again, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about this, just to give you a glimpse on, the, on this. And for sure, somebody will cover the ceiling or the structure of the reservoir in general. So you will see the reservoir requires source rock. You will see water at the bottom, followed by oil, less dense. If there is gas, it will be on the top of it. And you have to have a seal on the top of your this reservoir to prevent any further migration of hydrocarbon. So that requires three things. So for any source rock, for I'm sorry, for any reservoir, for any potential of hydrocarbon to be produced, you have to know where is the source rock, where is the reservoir, and where is the ceiling. If there is no ceiling, there is no reservoir. If there is no source rock, there is no reservoir. If there is no container for the hydrocarbon to live in, which is the porosity, there is no reservoir. So the three main components is the source rock, the reservoir, porous rock, and the ceiling to prevent any further migration of the hydrocarbon, okay? So this is the basic of the, the accumulation of hydrocarbon in our reservoir. Then it comes a, a question, forget about the sandy stone limestone. This is the type of reservoir that we deal with. I will leave this to uh, another slide, okay? Now, we knew the mechanism. We knew how the hydrocarbon is generated. We knew the migration of the hydrocarbon. We knew the composition of our potential of hydrocarbon location. The question is, how can you find this? How do you find this reservoir? We're talking about 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 feet down. How can we know this from the surface? How can we predict where the hydrocarbon from the surface? Actually, that's the job of two of the, of the list of, of uh, engineers that we talked about at the beginning. This is the role of the geologist and the role of the geophysicist. So the role of the geologist and the geophysicist is to locate and confirm the existence of the hydrocarbon down beneath the earth or down beneath, beneath the surface of the earth. How the, can we find this out? So the geologist input is based on the understanding of the deposition through the years, we can predict the possibility of hydrocarbon accumulation. So the, the geologist, they have the prediction from the study of all what happened millions of years ago. Okay? Then, the, then the geologists will say, according to the understanding of what we see, they also look at something called outcrop with some kind of potential of some of the rocks that was created millions of years ago. They come at the surface, they study this, with this knowledge, we can actually predict the possibility of accumulation of hydrocarbon beneath the surface of the earth, okay? That prediction requires confirmation. And that's the role of the geophysicist. The role of the geophysicist to confirm the prediction of the geologist, okay? So there are two very, very important steps in the petroleum industry. Somebody to tell us, from our knowledge, from our experience, from our study, from our background, we predict accumulation of hydrocarbon in this area, in this field. Then the geophysicist will come and confirm what the geologist actually predicted. So these are the very important two steps. Right? Now, confirmation is used, we use what's called seismic data. 
So the geophysics are actually are the one who creates the seismic data and analyze the seismic data. What is the seismic data, okay? Seismic data gathering can be done either on land or offshore. We will look, look now for a video. The video will explain how do we do this, and then we will come, we'll, we'll actually talk about it after we, we look at the, this video. <laughs> So what they do, they are geophones, okay? They are geophones that they spread out in the field. There are so many designs of these geophones, how they spread them out in the field. And also there is a truck here that generate acoustic waves, sonic waves, okay? It's actually something that we, like, a, like a, the way you talk, when you talk, somebody will, will hear you. It's the same thing, but it's a different type of acoustic data. So, it's, so this truck will create an acoustic data that it will be sent down in there. It will reflect and be heard by these geophones. Okay, let's just continue on this. Now, we did this on the ground. It's easy to go and bring a truck on the ground. So what about, how about the offshore? We also drill offshore, also drill in deep water nowadays. How do we find this out? It's similar, but with a little bit of a different technology. Well, but instead of sending, for example, a sonic wave, we actually send a, an air wave or, or we just pump it in the air and see the, the wave will actually go through the water and get again get recorded by geophones symbol. So now the wave here is a compressed air that goes through the water all the way down to the 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 the, uh, the, the, show, the um, uh, water the uh, rock in there uh, and actually reflects back into the. the See, these aren't the wavelets. This is the recorded uh, 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 reflection of the waves, it's regardless of it's in the land or in offshore, is what you get. And it requires more processing to really understand what do we have down home. <laughs> So now we're talking about processing these wavelets that we receive from the seismic data. What does the processing do? It gives you actually a picture, a real picture of what's beneath, okay? And all these colors and all these accumulations, it will be identified later as where is your reservoir. For example, here is the reservoir identified by the, by the seismic data. Here is the potential of our reservoir. These are what we call faulting. I will leave the faulting and all this structure to one to other uh, uh, webinars. But this, are, this is the reservoir identified by the seismic data at a certain depth. This is the depth. Here is the reservoir. And that's the picture that we get. We get this picture in two dimensions. And also we get this picture in three dimensions as well. So from the seismic data, you collect this data and you get a clear picture in 2D or 3D now we do actually 4Ds, which is 
you do the seismic as a function of time as well. So the time is also something that we, we, we use in evaluation of the conditions of our reservoir based on time that the reservoir is spending, okay? Okay, so now we understood that the geologists predict the geophysics confirm. Now we know there is a high possibility, high potential of hydrocarbon zone that we need to drill for and get this hydrocarbon out, okay? Again, still there is some uncertainty in this, okay? The uncertainty was high at the, at just the prediction time. We actually lower the uncertainty more when we go for the confirmation step. So the geologist will have high uncertainty. The geophysicist will actually reduce the uncertainty. Now the drilling will confirm more and more and see if there is a really good potential there or not. So we identify, then this is the time to explore. And that's what the exploration well is all about. The exploration well is, comes after the geophysicist confirm the high possibility of accumulation of hydrocarbon beneath the Earth's surface. Okay. Now we go for exploring these reservoirs. Right? When we explore the reservoir, we drill wells. Okay. What are the type of wells that we drill? That doesn't have to be the exploration wells, all the wells. What are all the wells that we drill? Actually, we drill different type of wells. We drill vertical wells, that's, that's one thing. You go vertically from the point you start on the surface of the earth all the way down deeper into, into the earth. So vertical wells is one of the wells that we, we use. The second one is deviated wells. Sometimes we call it slanted wells. So the deviated wells is something that takes a different, it takes an angle. It's not really a straight well. Why we do this, we'll talk about this in a second. The third one are horizontals or lateral wells, which is actually more complex than the vertical well or the deviated well. The complexity of the well goes with this way. Vertical well is, is not easy, but it is the easiest of the three. Deviated is harder than the vertical well. Horizontal is harder than the deviated wells, and it requires more planning, more understanding of the reservoir, and also the stresses in the reservoir. So these are mainly the main, the main wells that we use, okay? How come we go from one well design to another well design? Well, it depends, okay? It depends on so many things. Let's just give you a one simple thing, just to keep this in mind. Here is a vertical well. When you drill a vertical well, here is, the, here is your reservoir. So you actually, here is the thickness of the reservoir that you created by your vertical well, correct? Now, if I drill a slanted well or a deviated well, let's just compare the thickness of the reservoir that you are subjected to. Now, let's just compare the vertical well with the deviated one. Here is the vertical one. Here is the thickness of the vertical one. We call it L1. So actually, if you are in a vertical well, here is the thickness that you actually exposed into your reservoir. Here is the deviated well. Here is the L2 from the symbol trigonometry. What you will see, L2 is bigger or more than L1. So L2 is higher than L1. It means you are actually exposed to a more length in your reservoir. And that's needed. You need to have more length in the reservoir for more production. Why we all not always do this? There are so many controlling factors, as I said, that actually decides should we go vertical, should we go deviated, what is the angle of deviation? What's the maximum angle of deviation? And so on. It's not a very straightforward, let's go drill a deviated well. No, it requires a lot of study, mainly what we call the well bore stability. Will the hole be stable or not if you do this? And that requires a lot of study. Now, if you go to the third one, which is the horizontal well. Horizontal well is actually, here is your target. You try to stay in your target as long as you can. So this is actually the length of the horizontal section of the well. So you start the well from the surface, you drill it in a way where you land in your reservoir and you stay in your reservoir. We call this horizontal well. Horizontal wells are more complex and it requires higher technology and it requires planning. But we do this and we do this in many, many ways now. Actually, horizontal wells probably or the lateral wells probably is the major way of producing now in the oil and gas industry. 
But again, it requires lots of studying, lots of uh, assurance that the hole will be stable and there's no, no problem to the reservoir or, or the well itself. Okay. All right. So now we decided what type of wells we will go for, vertical well, deviated well, horizontal well. Now let's drill the well. When you drill a well, we drill a well with what you call bottom hole assembly, okay? So first we identified the potential. We decided which well we're gonna go for. So let's just start drilling a well. What is the first uh, component when you drill a well? Bits, okay? What is the bit? Bit is the first component of the bottom hole assembly. It is the one that will have certain teeth with certain type of material, a certain type of angle, with certain type of composition, with certain type of arrangement together. Okay, so many factors that the, the, the bit engineer will consider when he designs this drilling bit. So we need an engineer with a good mechanical engineering background and a good understanding of the rock stresses and a good understanding of the rock composition. See, that's the link now between what you study in petroleum engineering from the composition of your rock and what the mechanical engineer needs to know. Here is the link now. The mechanical engineer will design this drilling bit. Actually, as I said, the angle and the structure of the, of, of the teeth, this is what called the teeth, the structure of this tooth, actually, and the angle, the type of material we, 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 you, you use, and the arrangement of this is very, very important in optimizing the drilling of a well. So this one, we call it the tricomb. So the tricomb bit is one of the examples that we use, of the bit examples that we use in the oil and gas industry. There are some other types, natural diamond, impregnated, and also the PDC or the polycrystalline uh, diamond compact. These are different type of bits that we use. I'm very sure you will cover this in some more details in other webinars. But this is the basic first component of any bottom hole assembly of drilling. Right. Here is the bit, as you can see right there. Here is the bit, as you can see, mounted before it goes inside the well bore. Here is the bit at the, at the rig floor. So it's actually connected to other things. We'll talk about these things again later. Here is the bit, as you can see, this is the tricone bit. This is the one that we talked about at the very beginning. Here is the bit that you see right there on the offshore. Here is the bit on, on the land. So this is the first component that you lower inside the earth and to try to drill with it. We'll talk about how this actually be drilled, okay? Sometimes we need to enlarge the hole. For example, the bits that we use in our industry has standard dimensions. The API, the American Petroleum Institute, actually put standards on the bit sizes. You cannot go and manufacture any bit size you want. There are standard bit sizes based on so many studies done by so many uh, industry experts and the API came up with the optimum sizes of the drilling bits. But sometimes we like to increase the, 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 the hole size a little bit more. That's why the industry developed what's called enlarging the small well bore. How can we enlarge the small well bore? Something also requires a lot of mechanical engineering and a lot of understanding of the rock, okay? So to call it hole openers. Here is an example of the hole opener. Watch this one, and also I'll talk about this while we're doing it, okay? Here is actually the bit, and here is the hole opener on the top. So this is the bit, and this is the hole opener. You can see there are some uh, sides here. These sides will have certain type of, of, of other ways of drilling, okay? So this will open. Now, when we need it, it actually opens here. And when you drill this one, drill a certain size, and this one opens or enlarge it to a different size. So now you can see if you started with a smaller size, then you give, came up with the same size that you started with, okay? Because in, from this hole, you cannot go with a larger size. You have to go with a smaller size, then you start opening with the hole opener, okay? So the hole opener is a methodology when we cannot go down and drill with a bigger size because of the limitation that we put in the, in the previous section, we cannot go with a big size of bits. 
you can go with a smaller size and use the enlarging or the hole opener to enlarge the whole size itself. Again, mechanical engineers are very, very well needed in the way we drill the well and in the way we design this type of tool. Okay. So these are the bits. Now, the bit will not be able to rotate on its own. Okay, we need we need what to make the bit, the bit to rotate. We need motors. Okay. And that's why the bottom hole assembly is all about. You start with the bit, then you have to have a motor on the top of the bit to rotate this bit, okay? All right, so the drilling bit there, then the motor to drive the bit. We actually have two types of motors, okay? okay? The first type, which is very well known, is called the mud motor. What is the mud motor? Remember the mud, the drilling fluid? One of these, so the, the main uh, job of the mud or the drilling fluid is to rotate the bit, okay? So rotating the bit with the mud motor. Let's just see how this one works. So now, as you see, here is the drilling bit. It's actually rotating because there is a mud motor that is driven by pumping the mud in it. It actually rotates and rotates the, the drilling bit, okay? This is very important. Not the whole string is, is rotating. Only the bit is the one that's rotating, okay? So not the whole thing is. Here is the mud motor, and here is the one that drives only the bit, but the whole thing is not really moving, yeah? It's only the only bit. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, the sound of the video is not clear, so we would really appreciate it if you can uh, not, uh, you know, um, oh my God. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you can really do all the uh, explanation on the video, but not operate the video because it's not clear to everyone. They cannot hear it. Okay. All right. So I, I, let, me, let me talk it now, okay? So uh, as, as I said, the, the motor is the one that, that drives the bit rotating, and that's how, how it happens. The mud is actually rotating the, the bit and not the whole bottom hole assembly. Let me just, let's do this one more time, okay? Here is the drilling bit, and here is the mud motor. The mud motor actually drives the bit and rotates the bit for drilling, all right? Then the mud motor itself, is not all, the whole thing is not rotating, not the whole beach air rotating, only the well head is rotating. When you pump the mud into the mud motor, the mud motor rotates and it rotates. See, the rotation is inside the mud motor, not the whole beach air. The whole beach air is not rotating. The mud motor is the one that's connected to, to the bit and the bit is rotating by this mud motor, okay? Right. Now, there's also some other things, motors, and remember, we actually drilling deviated wells and we're drilling horizontal wells. So we need what we call directional motors. Directional motors has certain flexibility. The flexibility of the direction motor is to how to generate the angle and how to go from the vertical into the deviation and from the deviation into the horizontal, okay? So here is the mud motor. I'll get, let, me, let me just uh, uh, turn, turn the, light, uh, the sound off, okay? Here is the mud motor and you can see there Here's the mud motor. You will see now how we generate the angle from the mud motor. Okay. Just one second here until we reach that thing. Okay. This was called the bent housing. This is the bent housing that actually goes for the directional control. Okay, so as you can see, this is called the bend housing. This is actually can create the angle. And you can see there's some flexibility in there that actually drives this, mo this, this uh, motor into taking an angle and orient it.
So going from vertical to horizontal to deviated is controlled by this type of motors. So the mud motor cannot generate this angle, but the directional motors is the one that has the Benta house that actually generates what we call the deviated angle, and you can deviate with it. I'll go back and just show you uh, a little bit more on this, this the, the shape of the this bent housing. Uh, this is the one. As you can see, you can actually create an angle in between, and you can change from being vertical going that direction into an angular, so you can actually get the deviation of the well. Okay. okay. So let's just let's just see the whole thing of the bottom hole assembly, how it works. Okay. Here is the here is the 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 uh, bit is rotating. Here is your mud motor or directional motor. And here is the mud motor or the directional motor. There now you need to put some other things over it, like like a crossover sub that goes between the drill drill collars are a group of of uh, uh, steel that we put there. Sometimes we put we put the heavy heavy weights to make sure that we pressure and we can create the best uh, condition for drilling a well. It is how you can go from the directional motor into making an angle and staying and creating horizontal drilling. So that's how we control this from the surface by controlling the angle, putting weights on bits, making sure that the bit will drive and cut through the deformation rock in a most efficient way. Right? So now we talked about this. We talked about <coughs> we talked about the, the bits that we drill with and the motor that actually connected to the bit for the drilling. Now let's go drill the well. Can you do that? I'm so sure it was a big one. No, you cannot do that. You still need a very important factor, another factor that's needed for drilling a well. What is it? Yes, we have the bit. Yes, we have the motor, but you cannot drill without drilling fluids. Okay. So the drilling fluid is the second one or the most important one, quite frankly. So the drilling with is combined with the, the drilling fluid, combined with the drilling bits, and combined with the motors, is the three major components in drilling anyway. Drilling, the, the, the mud is very, very important in lubricating, cooling, carrying the cuttings. Okay? It will actually help all the op drilling operation, making sure that you have a stable well, very well lubricated, all the cuttings that cuts by the drilling bit is actually lifted all the way to the surface. So, it's, so this is the function of the drilling fluid. Drilling fluid requires a chemical engineer. Chemical engineer who knows exactly what is the rock composition is, what is the, the pressure in the reservoir, and how can you maintain the pressure in the well bore equivalent to the measure, measure pressure of the reservoir to avoid any type of collapse. So the drilling fluid function is very, very critical and very, very crucial in drilling a well, right? Okay, okay. So here is the function of the drilling fluid. So the function of the drilling fluid, so, much, so many functions actually. Okay. So the first one is controlling pressure as we talked about, okay? The second function is removing the cuttings that was cut by the bits cooling and lubricating because high temperature from the drilling comes out, gathering information from the rock strengths and all this, and also bounce on and, 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 and do the pressure uh, equalization in there and transmitting power from the mud into the mud motor to rotate the bit. So it has a lot of functions. It's a key component. And the design of this mud from the chemical composition, from the weight of the mud, from the composition of the mud is very critical. And it requires a very good chemical engineer who understands the petroleum rock and make sure that he will not do any damage to our reservoir, our reservoir when he drills through with these type of fluids. Okay? So this is a very important role of the chemical engineer. Now, let's just lower the, the BHA or the bottom hole assembly. Here is the rig. All right. And you can see right there, here is the bottom hole assembly. Here is the bit going, going down to the wheel bore, as you can see right there. 
and this is controlled by all these drilling engineers at the uh, at the uh, at the rig floor and you can see it's everything is lower now and you start pumping the the uh, the mud and rotating see this is how the rotation happens and this is how the drilling starts okay everybody see that bit motor mud are the major components and it requires petroleum engineer requires drillers requires chemical engineers so all of these they have to work in a teamwork understand the role of each one of them and effect of each one of these roles on the drill okay so let's just optimize the the, the drill by, by animation here if you look at the how we drill a well okay this is how things are, are coming now here is your bit okay now we pump the mud okay right and you can see the mud when you pump it, it actually rotates and then it would rotate the drilling bit. Drilling bit, it will do, do cuttings and the mud will take this up, yeah, uh, up to the surface, okay? This is a very important video, so I will, I will redo it again, okay? Here is when you lower your BHA into the well bore, okay? Here is in a static phase and it's not working yet. Now the mud is open. You push the mud, the mud will start rotating this bit and the bit will start drilling and the cuttings will be lifted up okay, through the annulus and all the way up to the surface, okay? Everybody, everybody understood now how, how this operation works. And you can see here are the tricone and the, how they work together and how they rotate and the rotation of this will cut through the rocks and all the cuttings will be lifted by the drilling fluid. Let's just look at the horizontal well, okay? Here is, here is the way we drill a horizontal well. Okay? Again, same BHA, but in this case, we are, using, we are actually using a, exactly, we are not using the mud motor, we're using the uh, rotating motors with the pouch, okay? Here is, here is the way we drill a vertical well, right? Then, we start building the angle. Here is, here is how we deflect the bottom hole assembly and build an angle until we reach from the bending. It takes about half a, a mile to do this actually to reach into the horizontal section. Then we start drilling horizontally. So the most important part, you start vertically, then you start building angle. Let me go back again. So you start going vertically. Okay. All right, here's the vertical one. Then you go down to the bottom hole assembly. Now we're going what? With a directional motor. You start drilling. And from the directional motor, you can build an angle. Here is you created the deviation until you stay into your reservoir horizontally. And you keep going into the reservoir as long as you can reach. There are some limitations on this for sure. You studied this in petroleum engineering. How far can we reach based on the pressure from the starting point to the ending point and the production as well, okay? So this is how we drill a horizontal well with the bottom hole assembly that we just talked about, okay? Now, we drill the well. We first of all, we identified by geologists. We confirm by the geophysicists. We drill the well by the combination of mechanical engineers and uh, uh, chemical engineers and drillers all of these, they combine together and design a well and you drill a well. Now we reach the target. Need, we need to understand what is the potential of hydrocarbon there. One of the most important parameters that we need to measure is the porosity, for example. How much porosity do we have? How much hydrocarbon do we have? Then there comes the role of the logging. So the logging comes after you drill the well and we evaluate this. So we do logging either after drilling or while we are drilling. So what is the wild line will do for us? Here is, <coughs> here is the logging tool. So you actually go, you drill the well. Here is the logging tool. It actually acquires with certain type of measurements, acquire what we call well logging data. Here is the well logging data. We measure certain parameters. We measure porosity. We actually need to identify the volume of hydrocarbon that we have. We identify the potential of the hydrocarbon in these zones, okay? So the evaluation can be either wild line or wild drilling. How we can do wild drilling, we put the tools 
on the BHA. So here is the BHA that we drill with, and here are the tools, okay? And the tools in this case, they rotate with the drilling bit, okay? Now in this, the, the, the advantage of logging while drilling is that you can see 360 degrees around you because the rotation of the bottom hole assembly, this rotation will give you the chance to look at 360 degree instead of looking at one side as it is the case in the wildlife. So what is the advantage of using the LWD? We actually can measure 360 degrees because the, we are in at the time of drilling, so everything is rotating. So we actually rotate and see 360 degrees. You can do this while drilling. If you do that, if you do it after drilling, then you will lower the tools using a wire line and acquire at a certain a certain direction of the well bore where the your tool is looking at. Okay, so this is an advantage of the logging wire drill. Okay, so what do we do from the evaluation? The most important part is porosity. How remember we talked about the porosity as the container of my hydrocarbon. So the porosity is the first one we look at from the evaluation side. Hydrocarbon volume is a very important part because we need to make sure that the porosity, the hydrocarbon is in there, not only 100% water. 100% water are not interested in this type of zone in the petroleum industry. You are interested in the zone that the source rock created the hydrocarbon and migrated to my reservoir. Okay. Other important parameters, we're not, not gonna talk about this because some other things that we need to look at as well, but the most important two things is porosity and the hydrocarbon volume in our pores. Okay. Now, we completed the drilling. Can we leave the hole this way? No, we cannot leave the hole this way. You have to go and case the hole, doing the casing. So casing and cementing is very, very important operation. Right? So we have to put casing because we need to lift the drilling fluid out of the well bore. We need to put the casing inside the well bore and cement the casing into the well bore, making sure my hole is in a very stable condition. It will never collapse. So we use this steel casing <laughs> with certain sizes, again, controlled by the API, the American Petroleum Institute. They control the sizes, they control the types, they control the material. Actually, it differ depending on the depth that you are drilling, depending on the pressure of your reservoir, so many parameters that goes into selecting the type of casing that you use, okay? So casing is very important. Once you do the casing, you start cementing the casing into the well bore, okay? Let's just see how these things actually work. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now we go there, we, we drill the well. Here is how we drill the well. Once you drill the well and you reach your target, all right, now we're still drilling the well. Okay, you pull out of the well bore, leaving the well bore here filled with, okay, now we go to the casing. Here is the casing. The okay, casing is a steel pipe. You put in there, then you pump the cement inside the casing, so the cement will go in between the casing and the formation, cementing this zone. This zone has to be very well cemented between the casing and the formation, okay? It's very, very important. Once you do this, you go with what's called wiper trip, clean out the whole thing. Then you start drilling the part of the cement down door and you continue drilling. So this is the first uh, casing, continue drilling. You go for the second casing, third casing, and so on, okay? So the casing function is to keep the whole contact and to keep the borehole very, very stable. Okay, again, one more time for this one. Here is you drill the well, you finish drilling, you pull out of the hole, you go down with the casing, then you start pumping cement. Here is now we're pulling out of the well bore. Now we're going down with the casing. Here is the casing. Then you start pumping the cement, okay? You pump the cement in here, the cement will go in the annulus between the casing and the formation, making, making sure that this casing is very well cemented to the well bore and keeping the well bore in a very good condition. Okay, all right. Now we cemented the well, we drilled the well, we put the casing, we cemented the well, so the well is ready for production. 
Okay. How to produce this well? And remember, we put actually casing in there. Casing is a very solid steel, right? And this will actually isolate the formation from the well bore. Then we need to have a path for the hydrocarbon to get in the well bore. How do we do this? We create this by what we call perforation. Perforation is creating a hole from the well bore through the casing, through the cement into the formation. So this one will create a path. So shooting perforating charge using perforating guns. What is the perforating gun? What is the perforating charge? Let's just take a look at this. So perforation is the second step after, after the cementing, okay? Here is the perforation. <laughs> Here is, a, here is a perforating gun. It goes here and then start shooting charges. Charges will make a hole inside the formation. Here is how we, see that one? I will repeat this one one more time. Here is the charges creating holes inside the formation. So this hole connects the well bore with the formation so the fluid can flow into the well bore. Now you pull out of the hole and you, that, that, that's the way we, we do the perforation, okay? Everybody understand the perforation now? Is actually you lower a perforation gun, you actually uh, shoot the charges, get it creating holes from the casing to the cement to the formation, allowing the hydrocarbon path to go from the form from the formation into the well bore. Okay. How about if the reservoir is very tight and there is not really much of a possibility for the hydrocarbon to come out? That's when we go go for fracturing, right? Fracturing or, or we go for, for what we call production enhancement. So the fracturing or production enhancement is actually an operation where our reservoir does not have ability or does not have permission to give to the fluid to go from the formation into the well bore. Now we make this type of permeability. We make this type of connectivity, okay? What's called hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing is the one of the production enhancement methodology that we create path for the hydrocarbon to flow. Remember, we created perforation here, but the perforation is not good enough for the production. The rock is very tight in permeability. It doesn't allow the fluid to flow from the formation through the perforation into the well bore. So what, what, what do we do? We do the next step. So the next step is, to do hydraulic fracturing, okay? What we do with this, we actually use certain type of fluids. We pump these fluids with certain type of the problems. We'll talk, also we'll talk about this later in one of these lectures, but you pump the fluid and you create cracks. These cracks is the path for the fluid to go through because the perforation on its own does not allow this or it does not give you the proper production or the optimum production that you need. So you create these cracks and these cracks, I'll, I'll go to this one. You create these cracks and these cracks is the, the, the one that produ help producing your reservoir, okay? Now we drilled so many wells, okay? You drill the well, you produce the well, you did so many things in the reservoir to make sure you reach the target and you produce the target, okay? Now, once you drill one well, two wells, three wells, 10 wells, 10, 100 wells, then you go for the one of the most important part is the field management. Field management is how to manage these many wells that you drill to optimize your field production. Very critical step. You can drill the well as much as you want, but if you don't have a good field management of controlling the well production, making sure that everything in each well is in an optimum condition. Your reservoir is producing to its optimum capacity. That's what the field management is. And that's a big role for so many reservoir engineers. Okay? Deciding the location, following up of the daily production of each well, making sure there is nothing as a hindrance either in the formation or in the well bore that prevents the hydrocarbon from flowing. This is a big job big team in any operating company that actually takes care of the, the field management to optimize the field production. Okay? Now, we reach it to the almost the last uh, slide or, or so. Can we see the water flowing? Yes, you can see the water flowing and the oil flowing. 
Okay, it's a very interesting picture to look at. Some of the companies actually develop what's called downhole video tool. You can actually lower a camera inside the well bore to see the fluids moving into the well bore. Let me see if how the water will look like in this case. Okay. Look at the water. This is the water droplets. As you can see that, all these droplets coming out. Okay. This is actually a water zone that's producing 100% water. Okay, so this is, you can see that from, from there. Okay, sorry. And how about the oil one? If it would come now. Unfortunately, the oil is not coming. Anyway, so you will see water zone and oil zone producing by what we call downhole, downhole video, okay? I think it took a long time. I need to make sure that I will, I will, uh, in this so in conclusion of this presentation that the petroleum industry hires a diverse of engineering skill you see how all these engineering skills they come together in an integration and teamwork everybody needs to know everybody else's uh, input and to optimize and make sure that to help the other engineers in getting their part of the operation done successfully it's a combination of so many things, geologists, geophysists, okay, drilling engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers. All of these are combined in operating and service companies. Everybody needs to know part of that business. And it's very important to get a general understanding. And this is exactly what this lecture is all about, a general understanding of the petroleum industry and all these engineering skills, how they are linked together to come up with an optimum drilling, optimum field management for optimum production and profitability, okay? Multiple operations in the day-to-day -day business requires understanding of the business concepts, integration, teamwork, and strong communication skills, okay? Keep this in your mind, train yourself on, on how to work in a team, then you serve on how to be a team member. This is, believe it or not, more important, okay? Or as much as important as your engineering skills. You can have the best engineering skills, but if you are not a team player, if you are not an integrating person, if you don't have the, a very strong communication skill, that engineering or the high engineering skills will not help you out a lot. As you can see, so many engineering aspects so many engineering integration, and you need to make sure that you are part of this. All right. All right. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the uh, the uh, this presentation, and if uh, I'm not sure if we'll be allowed to answer some of the questions or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mustafa, for the great presentation. Uh, unfortunately, for the time constraint. Uh, we won't be able to answer any question, but um, I gathered and I collected all the questions. I'll be sending you the word file so you can answer the question and we will post a video on uh, our Facebook page answering uh, pretty much uh, most of the questions or the, at least the repetitive ones. Uh, thank you all for joining. We'll be giving you some break before our next session at 7 p.m. Cairo time. Uh, I just have a uh, one announcement. Due to technical issues, we won't be posting any quizzes for today's two sessions. Uh, until we solve this, we will be updating you on our Facebook page, and most probably we will be posting the quizzes for today and tomorrow's sessions uh, tomorrow on our Facebook page. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Mustafa, and thank you all for joining. And looking forward to see you in maybe half an hour or so. Thank you. Thank you, Nia. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.